How's everyone doing today? This is Chopping It Up Hardcore with Hal Capone, special edition style. Today, my special guest is Evan Kilgore from the amazing band Reds. Newly reunited, ripping it up. They got a show coming up this coming Saturday. We're going to talk about that. Evan was also the founder of Waking Records, which put out some amazing stuff in the early 2000s. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, we'll get into all kinds of shit. But um, yeah, just glad to be back and uh, honored to have Evan with us. Uh, what's up, Pete? Fabes, what's up? All right, I'm going to grab you right now. Let's see here. Evan, what's up? Hey, how's it going? How? Good. How are you? I'm good. I gotta get, gotta get myself right. Uh, Hold on, I'm kind of out of, out of the. Let's see. let's see. Yeah, figuring out the right, uh, the right arrangement of phone is, is you know, I got it stacked <laughs> up on like three boxes. <laughs> got a tiered support system over here. Yeah, I thought I had it right, but I guess not. But uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time out to do this. I appreciate it. I know we we were talking about this a long time ago, and. Uh, I kind of had a little hiatus, and uh, now I'm kind of, you know, staggering back and forth doing it. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time out. Nice, yeah. Thanks for asking me. I love watching when, when you do it, and uh, you've had a lot of homies on, and so it's always good to, to hear the stories. And, and remember, because I'm old, and, and my memory's not great, so. <laughs> I get to, people, yeah. people, people you've had on have told stories. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, was, I think I was there for that. Uh, I was actually watching the uh, chat you had with Ron from Gene Scene um, the other day, and uh, I forgot all about that. I watched that live, and then I kind of went back, and because I asked kind of the same similar questions that he did uh, about, like, you know, when you first started wa uh, listening to music and stuff like that, and you said, yeah. you said the first, uh, you know, music that you listened to was uh, Boys to Men and uh, New Kids on the Block. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, uh, I didn't do that Instagram thing that everybody's doing this week about like what was your first concert, you know, best and all that. But uh, new, new Kids on the Block definitely the first concert, followed closely, I think, by Jimmy Buffett. Uh, so you know, a young uh, what do they call him, Parrot Head? Um, <laughs> yeah, and then it, it you know it evolved the natural progression from there to you know Palatka or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a quick jump though. From New it's narrow, you know, Florida. It's the Florida scene down there. Jimmy Buffett and Plotka, uh one of one of Plotka's earliest records was a little known split with Jimmy Buffett. Um no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I always ask this too, is when you were listening to that as a kid, what kind of brought you into like the hardcore and and, and like screamo type of stuff? I mean, did you get into like heavy metal first? Because like my progression was like you know, uh, it was like heavy metal to like thrash metal. Then it was to like New York City hardcore, the old school stuff, and then Boston old school hardcore stuff. I mean, what was your progression, and what did you kind of like in that, you know, beginning part? Yeah, I um. So I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, which um, has, you know, Thou Thou is from there, and that's the Baton Rouge's most recent kind of claim to musical fame. Before that, it was better than Ezra. Uh, so there was never like a huge, for me, there was that I was aware of or that I was even a part of. Like growing up, um, there was never like a huge scene. Like oh, you know, I have friends who grew up in New York or Boston. They're like, yeah, I started going to shows when I was thirteen, and Harley Flanagan bought me my first, you know, whatever. Yeah, and so uh, I never was a part of any of that. So I was very relying on radio and MTV to, to kind of figure things out. Um, and then just going into the CD store in town and buying things purely based on album covers. So that got me pretty quickly from, um, I, don't know, I think the, the kind of main progression would have been like rate, just radio stuff. And then hearing the first thing I remember hearing on the radio where I was like, holy shit, this is different was faith no more. Mm -hmm. Um, and just being, and then seeing them on like Saturday Night Live and being like, music can be weird. Music can like, you know, it's, 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 it, it can be expressive. It can be uncomfortable. Um, and I think I, I got really into that. I think, you know, I also like from Boys to Men got into like 
the hair metal is like, you know, Guns N' Roses was probably like the first thing where I was like, all right, this is, this is more rocking Guns N' Roses and uh, Bon Jovi, which, uh, you know, now that I live in New Jersey, I, I, you know, take a little more pride in my Bon Jovi heritage, but um, yeah, so Bon Jovi and Guns N' Roses and then Faith No More was kind of the first like, oh, there's some weird shit going on out there uh, and got into that. And then from there, I think I just would go into record stores and be like, what's some weird looking album covers and and uh, and got into, yeah, like death metal and heavy metal. Uh, I think like found a Deicide record that I was like, holy shit, this looks evil. I'm into it. Um, and so like Deicide and Voivod and Celtic Frost and, and all of that stuff. And then uh, from there, I think it was probably just like listening to Headbangers Ball. Um, and 120 minutes and i remember you know seeing uh seeing green day on the john stewart show for the first time and being like i think this is gonna be my music i think this like it just you know it hit it the right and, and you know nirvana was before that and i love nirvana um but i think like hearing green day and being like this is this is my music and so um from there i got like heavily into you know what we used to do back in the early '90s, you know, you uh, you get a Green Day record, you get you get Dookie, and you look it up. Oh, like uh, yeah, I got this recently. I'm psyched on this. The uh, the huge ridiculous like Dookie box set, you know, uh, with like seven different versions of Dookie. Um, but you know, you get into you get into a CD and you look at the liner notes and you're like, oh, it says something about Lookout Records. What is Lookout Records? And this was before the internet, so like, I mean, '94, I guess early early internet. I don't know. Um, and so I remember like hearing about Lookout Records, getting a catalog and sitting, I remember like physically the feeling and, and just sitting on the couch in my parents' living room, all the way to the right, there was a little table and just going through the Lookout Records catalog and, and circling things in there, um, circling every band that, you know, Green Day had mentioned in their liner notes. And from there, uh, kind of the pathway to, I think where I really have fallen mostly was uh, the Pinhead Gunpowder CD was probably like one of the most important CDs in my life, uh, Jump Salty. Um, and they, uh, you know, through, through there, I was like, oh, you know, there's this other singer that sounds angrier than Billy Joe. And it was uh, Sarah Kirsch. Uh, and I was like, I like, I like her voice. Uh, and uh, figured out that Sarah was in Fuel and, you know, kind of just went down that pathway from like, Green Day, directly from Green Day to Fuel to then, uh, you know, Torches to Rome, Bread and Circuits, Ebullition Records, and that just kind of opened up the whole gateway for me to, uh, to you know, DIY, hardcore, political hardcore, uh, and things like that. And then, you know, I still love to look out and everything look out in, in 98, summer of 90, summer 99, I got to intern at Lookout Records for a summer. I think early on, in high school, I, would, I was telling my partner about this the other day, like, you know, reading about Gilman Street and reading about, you know, Lookout Records early on, I was like, oh, I could start a record label. I could help start a club. So I remember sitting in high school and like drawing the floor plan to like venues that I was going to open when I grew up and like thinking about, you know, what would, uh, what would my perfect venue be? And like thinking about opening venues and starting a record label. Yeah, and then interning at Lookout uh, in 99, which was interestingly kind of like right at the beginning of their downfall. Um, and I got to, at the time, I didn't realize what was going on, but kind of looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why it didn't work out over there. Um, and, and yeah, and so that was kind of my pathway to DIY hardcore and political hardcore and then everything that opened up for me. And I, I know you were talking about the Florida um, scene because Louisiana is so, you know, you know kind of close to Florida. Yeah. Uh, that was very, like, for me, being up in New England, when that Florida scene hit back in the day, it was, like, huge for me uh, listening to all that stuff. Like, you were you mentioned Palaka, but, like, Reversal of Man is, like, my all-time favorite band of all time. Um, and I was into, like, Drag Body and Blood Lead and, and just, like, uh, you know, uh, what was there? Uh, um, Omega Man. There was a band called Omega Man that was like I was in love with. Uh, Florida was like very special to me, and and I mean, I heard you saying that you was it the No Idea Distro. You put a big uh, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't, I'm trying to remember how I got into the Florida stuff. Uh, well, you know, it was close. And I think like for most of my life up to that point, it was like, everything's happening in DC, New York, or the Bay Area. And so it was like, all these things felt very far away. Um, I think I just heard about, I probably heard about Florida stuff from, uh, I spent a lot of time as a kid in AOL punk chat. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of because I had three friends in high school who were into punk, but they were into like, and they're still some of my best friends, but they were into, you know, Misfits, Dead Kennedys, Ramones. Mm -hmm. And because I was, you know, uh, like wanted to be the serious political hardcore kid, I was like, I'm not listening to any band that sings questionable songs about horror movies or whatever. Um, and so I didn't get, I didn't, honestly didn't get into, you know, Misfits or even the Ramones. I liked them. I was like, oh, it's catchy, but I didn't, you know, really appreciate them until later once I stopped taking myself quite so seriously. Um, but yeah, I think just hearing from people about stuff going on in Florida and being like, oh, it's nearby. And, uh, you know, Discount was a band that really kind of fit into like my pop punk tendencies back then. And, uh, and I really wanted to see them. And so I booked my first show. I think I heard that they were touring. I think I called No Idea and was like, hey, I want to book a discount show. Can you put me in touch with them? Um, and I think I talked to Bill from Discount on AOL. Uh, and so, yeah, started setting up shows for Discount, uh, set up a show for them outside of New Orleans that was uh, wildly poorly attended at a skate park. Still feel bad about that. I didn't know what I was doing, um, but it was fun. And then uh, we we're friends with them and then through them, Hot Water Music, and uh, they, you know, they and Hot Water Music stayed with me after when they were touring together. Um, and then, yeah, I think the thing that resonated for me about Gainesville was, I've talked a lot about this recently, being, being a guy from the South, uh, I think I had a very, very strong uh, averse reaction to anything that seemed overly masculine mm -hmm. um, because of all these, you know, like kind of toxic masculinity uh, ideas around what it meant to be a Southern man, uh, you know, uh, Neil Young agrees. Um, and so I liked hard, aggressive, you know, loud music, but, you know, a lot of the hardcore bands from like New York, Boston or whatever just didn't resonate for me because it was like kind of in my world, in my mind, like tough guy yeah. shit. Uh, and I've come to, I've come to appreciate that more in later years again. Uh, but, um, yeah, like, like the Gainesville scene was like, you know, a lot of dudes dudes uh playing really loud and heavy music but it wasn't again about like fucking people up or whatever uh and you know I, I, that resonated for me it was close and i went and hung out with friends there a few times and yeah so the gainesville scene was big for me somebody mentioned early grace i loved early grace yeah, you know get that get that get that metal that metal fix and then yeah and then everybody in gainesville was also like thinking about early grace everybody in gainesville was also doing like zines and stuff and zines were always a big part of my pull towards the hardcore scene. Um, Dave Amendment, I think, was the guy who did, uh, uh, what was the zine that he did? But he was like toured with Early Grace and um, uh, I can't remember the name of this. I have it around here somewhere. But, um, you know, and Allison from Discount did a zine and Mike Taylor from Palatka did a zine and Travis Fristo did zine. And so like, it just, uh, you know, it just felt like such creativity was happening in that scene uh, and it really resonated for me. And so, um, yeah, and it was great. And then um, a lot of those bands would come through New Orleans uh, and play in New Orleans. Uh, Brian Funk, who's the singer for Thou, uh, has basically single-handedly carried the New Orleans scene for close to 30 years. And he was doing all the shows back then, or most of the shows back then at Dixie Tavern and, you know, all those bands would come and, and play and uh, yeah. And so I got to see a lot of those bands, whereas like bands from the n Northeast would not come through as much. Cause you know, Louisiana is kind of I don't know, out of the way. And I think people have thoughts about Louisiana, uh, especially playing in new Orleans. And, and then again, Baton Rouge, despite being a college town with a huge uh, university there, just didn't have much of a punk scene at the time. Later, my friends, uh, after I moved up here, uh, started doing more house shows there and, you know, Billy Thompson, who's in uh, Heavy Mantle and Secret Smoker and uh, a bunch of bands, still is down there and still keeping it going. So respect to Billy. Uh, he's been doing a lot down there for a long time. So do you still have, have like, um, ties down there for, you know, the, I guess, like, I would say, like, the smaller, like, DIY shows? Like, it, is it that still kind of thriving down there? Is it kind of, like, um, I know New Hampshire, like, where I live, was booming 
you know, in the late '90s, early 2000s, and now now it's completely dead. So I, I'm yeah wondering I, correlation. Down there, I honestly don't know. I was down there a couple of weeks ago and went and hung out with Brian in his record store, um, Sisters in Christ, in uh, uh, New Orleans. And, and chat with him and I was like you know where are the shows going on now and he listed a bunch of different spots so like mm -hmm. Brian definitely knows I have no idea um I know in Baton Rouge there's like a place called Mid City Ballroom that's a big uh I think it's a BYOB venue um and I know like Billy plays there a bunch I think he's opening up for Bob Mould there soon or somewhere nearby there soon um and but yeah I, I honestly don't know uh I bought a record. I asked Brian, I was like, well, you know, what's a local band I should buy a record from? And there was a New Orleans band beyond that isn't like hardcore or whatever. Uh, but you know, there's, you know, it's New Orleans. There's always something going on, but I don't know too much about it at this yeah. point. Yeah. Now, now, do you know the rapper Currency from New Orleans? Are you a big uh, Currency fan? I, I know. I know of Currency. I'm not a, not a huge fan, but, uh, but I've, I've heard the name. I probably, I, I feel like I've definitely heard some of the songs too, but is is that current uh current rapper or so, back yeah, in the he's day? Still, yeah no he's uh he's still going but he's been around for like 15 years or something like that so sorry some chunky thing in my milk in my coffee uh <laughs> yeah when we were down a couple weeks ago definitely listened to a lot of no limit songs uh no limit records stuff yeah. and on some mystical and some you know all that stuff master p uh it was good when i worked down there i worked at uh the first ever raising canes which is a chicken shop, chicken place that like has spread everywhere. But when I worked yeah. down there, there was just one, and it was like the late night, uh, go after you're drunk. We stayed open till four uh, when all the bars closed at two, um, and it was a period of time where Snoop was on No Limit, and so Snoop and Master P would come through the drive-through oh, window, oh, and uh, sick. I remember I remember debating with them about you know we had. We had the dipping sauce, and the dipping sauce was like 25 cents extra for a sauce, and they asked for extra sauce. I was like, oh, that'll be 50 cents, and they gave me shit about <laughs> making them pay extra for for uh, for sauce when they're, you know, they, they had money at yeah, the time. Yeah, exactly. But exactly. that's how you get money, you know? You keep your money, but not want to pay for the extra sauce. So, yeah, true, respect. True, true. Respect. true. Um, I wanted to talk about the timeline. So, you, you know, you were the founder of Waking Records, but did – you were you in any bands before Waking Records? Um, like what? Were, um, like what was it? Did you start doing shows and then you did the label and then the band came? Like what was the timeline of like? Yeah, in Louisiana. Um, sorry, I did something. I'm trying to get things off of my phone real quick because I ah. Uh, all right, I don't know how to get rid of the comments. Whatever, I'll see. Them. Uh, but um, in Louisiana, right, kind of. My last year there, I moved. I lived in Oregon for a year, and then I moved back to Louisiana and moved in with some friends. And we did a band there. They were all moving to Richmond soon, um, and we did a band there called Two Months because we were only going to be around for two months. And that was the first band that I really ever did. Um, and we were all living together, and I quickly came to uh, hate everybody that I was living with and everybody in the band. So most of the lyrics uh, in the band were about how much I hated all the other people in the band. Um, you know. Uh, and then from there, I didn't really do anything. Billy and I had started to try to do a band, but, uh, you know, uh, that didn't really go anywhere, um, before I left. And then I moved up to New York. Um, and I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, um, that when I moved up to New York it was summer of 2002. Um, and, you know, I moved up to New York, like seeing things about all these crazy shows at ABC No Rio and uh you know uh coney island high and brownies and all this stuff and i was like oh man there's just gonna be crazy shows all the time every band i want to see is going to be playing there and i came at this point in time where kind of everybody that had booking been booking those types of shows at abc no rio mm -hmm. left i found out i was talking about this guy paul granger um who's uh around back then and knows colin and all the Sasha guys and everybody um and so i came up and i was like all right it's it's showtime, and there wasn't like, I mean, compared to Louisiana, there was a lot going on. What's up, Paul? Um, and uh, and he was like, yeah, like around 2002, kind of the whole Screamo crew left. Everybody that was booking shows at ABC left. Uh, Diami took over, and he's kind of more of a, and he's still like booking like a lot of the shows in New York, but he's more of he he leaned more towards the like metalcore, metally stuff. Um, and so I was like, there's not a lot going on. 
but I was, I had just started teaching. I moved up to New York to start teaching. And so, uh, I was teaching in the Bronx in the first summer I was, the first year I was there, I was like, I want to start an after school photo program. But my school was kind of your stereotypical, uh, dysfunctional, like urban public school, like as stereotypical as you can get. Yeah. Like the kids were great. I still love the kids. I still maintain the kids were amazing. Cardi B was actually a student there. Um, when I was in eighth grade, she was in sixth grade, but one of my friends taught her. Um, and so <laughs> it's funny because so I, I, in order to raise money to do an after school program, I was like, I'm going to put out a, a benefit record. Um, and I also had got into teaching largely because of being inspired by Chris Jensen, who did Mountain Records. He was a teacher. He wrote a column about teaching and, and heart attack. And so I was like, I'm just going to follow the Chris Jensen pathway. And so um, he did a bunch of benefits records on on Mountain. So I was like, all right, I'm going to put out a, a benefit record to raise money for after school programs. The most inefficient possible way to raise money for anything, like, is to put out a benefit C record. And so I did a CD because I was like, well, it's going to raise more money. Um, and in doing that, I was on, on like, at that time, I was really on like the level playing message board. Yeah. Um, I don't think VLV was around yet. Uh, but so I was talking to all these band, all the level playing guys. And I, uh, yeah, I just was like, hey, want to do a record? Would you want to do this benefit CD? This is why. Would you be interested in doing Give Me a Song? Um, and very early on, Dima and Colin and Grillo and the fiction were like, yeah, like this sounds, sounds awesome. Let us know how we can help. Colin's also a teacher and, um, has, you know, been a big inspiration for me since back then. And, and now he's in reds, which is very exciting. Um, and so put out this benefit record. Um, and in doing that just made a ton of connections. I was talking to, uh, Tom, who's booking the fest that we're playing next week, yesterday, uh, about, yeah, like doing things like putting out a benefit record or booking a fest, even if bands aren't able to give you a record for it or song for it or play the fest, you make all these connections and people are like, oh, I want to help out in some other way. And so it helps kind of get the ball rolling uh, on those things. And so met a ton of people through doing the benefit CD, um, started hanging out with the fiction guys a lot. Dima helped do all the layout on the booklet for the CD and a lot of the art, the artwork for the CD itself. Um, and from there, basically Dima helped me. So doing the benefit CD, I was like, all right, I did this. I know all these people. I set up a, a show at the knitting factory to, for a CD release show. Um, and it made it clear. It like, it, it was like, Oh, the knitting factory, one of the like kind of bigger, more well-known venues in New York City just let me put on a show in their basement for free and it was really easy maybe I'll do more shows yeah. oh I have all these bands that like wanted to or did the, the benefit with me maybe I'll ask them if they want to do an LP or a seven inch or whatever and so it kind of went from there yeah. um, and then you know Dima helped me with pretty much every release after that uh, doing all the formatting and layout for that uh, for Waking Records um, and then you know uh, the fiction were all New York boys born and raised. And so, well, Dima wasn't born here, but uh, so only Colin could drive. And so the summer after that, they were like, hey, we're going on tour. None of us know how to drive except for Colin. And I was like, I can drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah and started touring with the fiction and, and hanging out with those guys uh, who are all like brothers. I'm still in touch and, and friends with all of them. Two of them I'm in a band with now um, still. Uh, yeah. And so from there, it was kind of like just open the world to, the, to that whole scene. Yeah. Um, and, all, and all those people, which has been great. Now, who Dima did grow up here? Dima did grow up here. Now, started who, up in the Bronx, I think. Who played that knitting factory show, the first one that you did? Do you remember? Uh, I might be, I might get this wrong, but it was Countdown to Putsch, which was Chris Jensen's band. Yep. Um, they had gone full improv noise jazz by that point, so that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that, I don't know if that was their last show, but like, uh, they, they, didn't, they weren't playing a lot around that time. So it was Countdown to Push. I'm, I, th I think I told you my memory sucks. The fiction countdown to push Helena Troy books lie sounds right. I have a flyer for it somewhere. Um, it's one of the few flyers I actually kept from back back then. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Well, that's a hell of a lineup for the first show. Yeah. And 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 all those you know all those people became like really close friends and and they're still friends and uh, and yeah uh, you know. 
the Helen and Troy guys are my boys. I love those two guys. Uh, for folks that don't know, you know, most of them went on to be in gospel, and then now, you know, Vinny and Matt are in medicinal. Um, and uh, yeah, they were the before I moved up to New York, I was in touch with them, and I set up a show for them in Baton Rouge, which was uh, ended up being like my going away party, and so. Uh, I remember talking to Matt Messina on the phone, setting up that show, and uh, being like, holy shit, people up in New York really do talk the way they do in the movies. Uh, it's got the best Long Island accent, love you, Matt, uh, Sunken Temple on here. And uh, yeah, and so like those dudes came down and played and were fucking great. And so, you know, the summer that I was first up here, you know, the first kind of folks I hung out with went out to Long Island for a couple of shows and uh, still love all those guys. So yeah, me too. I love those guys. Uh, I, I still have you know, your first uh, release, which um, I got rid of a lot of stuff, but I definitely kept this. Um, I want to talk about this just as like such a great comp. And there's a lot of like, not obscure bands, but like, you know, you have some common bands that people have heard of, but then there's, you know, like the South or, or, you know, um, yeah, it's like those bands, those songs are so good. And I don't know if a lot of people like go back and listen to this. Um, but I was, I was going to, pester you about like maybe you know do you think you would ever do like a band camp where you put your waking records releases up so that this stuff's not lost you know what i mean because like the shit you put out on that label is is amazing stuff and you literally have to search for it on youtube or something like that and i, I yeah feel like it would be easier yeah band camp. i've thought a lot i've thought about that because yeah a lot of them you know a lot of the stuff's not anywhere on the internet mm -hmm. It's not on streaming. It's on maybe YouTube for some of it, but not even all of it. Yeah. Um, there's a, a a podcast called I think it's called like My First Seven Inch or something, and they do uh, you know every week they kind of feature a different seven inch. And they did an episode uh, a few months ago over the summer on Bullets In, um, and their main gripe was like, "We got the seven inch. We were trying to find it on. I, I can figure it out, Dima. I can figure out how to put stuff up on Bandcamp." Uh, you know, I have relied on Dima for that. Uh, continuing the tradition of relying on Dima, uh, you know, he put up all the, the red stuff. But uh, I can figure it out. But, uh, but yeah, you know, a big thing on that podcast talking about Bullets In was, like, they're, they're mysterious. Nobody knows, you know, the songs aren't online. The songs aren't anywhere. Um, and I'm still in touch with all those guys. And so I know they had mentioned something about a discography coming out, so I don't know uh you know what's happening with that but i would love to like get that stuff up and every other you know record it up i think the the tricky part of it is and i don't know how tricky it is i'm i'm still in touch with pretty much every band i ever did anything with except for the hugs dudes they were always a little mysterious uh yeah. and after they stopped doing hugs they went on to do a band raku um and they went kind of down the more noise art sort of thing yeah and uh, I don't know that they disavowed hugs, but um, but yeah, I fell out of touch with them, but they were all sweethearts, so if, I'm sure I could track and Andy or Sean down. Um, but uh, but yeah, Raccoon was great. Um, but yeah, you know, I did because I was doing a benefit record label, um, and all the all the all most all of the records I did from the first one went on to be benefit records, and so I was always very much thinking about how can I and maximize the benefit. Um, and so for most of the records I did, I did CDs. Um, because back then, CDs were crazy cheap. Vinyl was, you know, not nearly as expensive as it is now, but still more expensive. And I was like, if I want to be able to make money, and you could also sell CDs for more back then than you could vinyl re yeah. generally. Um, if I want to be able to sell things and, and give actual money to a cause, rather than it just be like, oh yeah, we're benefit, but then we don't ever make shit. I needed to do CDs, um, and so uh, I did a lot of CDs. Which, in hindsight, I'm like, ah. um, you know, I feel like <laughs> I feel like if I had done all the vinyl for all the releases I did, I would have this like, I would be so proud of all those vinyl records and be like, yeah. And, and uh, but you know, the CDs, eh. I don't even, I don't, I don't actually own most of the CDs anymore. I don't, uh, but because I did all the CDs, other labels did the records, and so I did a lot of CD versions of records that Paul at Perpetual Motion Machine did the record for or um, Andy Malcolm or uh, Robert at Adagio. Um, and so 
uh, you know, there are a lot of other people involved in labels. And so I would just have to be like, hey, like, is everybody cool? with me putting this up on Bandcamp, I wouldn't, you know, my goal would definitely not be to monetize it or anything. So I don't, yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully nobody would care and everybody would be like, yeah, that's cool. But I think some of the bands also like might at this point, you know, 20 years later be like, eh, I don't think the world needs that. Yeah. Um, I would hope they would. Uh, I think everything I did was, was great and awesome. And I, I only put out records I really loved and believed in, but, um, but for the comp specifically, yeah, there's a lot of songs on there from bands. Like, I don't know that hurrah ever recorded anything. Yeah. Um, they were on like the VLV message board. My friend Tom, again, who's doing the, the fest next week, the C86th Fest in Ridgewood, um, which is an awesome fest if people are in the New York area. It's like all these crazy young screamo bands. Uh, I was talking to them yesterday and I found I mean, we're definitely the oldest people playing, so that'll be fun. Um, and But I think a lot of the kids are like high school, like early 20s. Um, so that'll be cool. And it's cool to see that scene kind of blowing up. But Tom was from South Carolina, where Hurrah was from, and he knows all those guys. And uh, I think what ended up on the comp from them was like a boombox recording from a practice. Oh, uh, and and I, I thought it was great. They were like, yeah, we'll send you something. And then that's what they sent me. And I was like, OK, like, I'll, I'll put this on there. Yeah. But it sounds OK. Um, the mastering that uh, Alan Dushes did at West West Side was great. Uh, and it sounds good. And then I couldn't even get any artwork from them. So I think I just drew a knife and put it on a on a booklet. and. Uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, like bands like the Fairies who are on there from New Orleans. Like, I love that band. They were great. Um, I also did a CD for them with uh, Josh, my, my good friend Josh, who did McCarthyism Records and Brian Funk from Dow. We released like their CD and it's like crazy, weird, unhinged, like, I don't know, punk. Uh, but like, you know, that stuff that mo a lot of people haven't heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on there that I feel like should, should get out there. Uh, I don't know, Vinny. I don't know. I don't know about Puke Tech. I can find out. Tom, I'm sure, would know that. Um, but, yeah, so I would love to get stuff up there. Yeah. I, I, like I said, it's kind of obscure, like, the releases. And, and if you're really looking, you have to search hard to find some of the, the releases you did. Um, speaking of CDs, um, oh, I know Casey from okay, Sorry, one more thing. Yeah, like, so, and two other bands that I think, like, very few people – know about that i would really love to get out there because i think that record is great is the uh sin of human history memory is perfection mm -hmm. split you know like uh some of the sin of human history dudes i think they're in what's the band uh uh lonely is an eyesore oh yeah uh, yeah justin they were in uh you know sometimes walking sometimes running they're great and then memory is perfection were friends of mine from baton rouge that i toured with uh and i love that rec i love that record and i don't think like most people have ever heard either of those bands and, and it's good it's good stuff so i'd love to like get stuff like that up yeah, you can't find anything really from Senna Human History Online at all. Like, it's it's kind of, I mean, you can kind of if you're really, really searching. Uh, but that band was amazing. I set up a show in Haverhill, Massachusetts with them. My old band played, and um, I think Breed Extinction might have played that show too. Uh, but they were super nice. And, you know, coming from New York to Haverhill, Massachusetts is kind of a trek. So, uh, um it was it was great to see them live and and uh i appreciated them playing honestly yeah i'm um, sorry i cut you off what were you saying about cds oh yeah uh i did you said that you don't have any barely of like what you put out for cds i know casey from iodine when his uh he stopped doing his label he was kind of stuck with like a, a bunch of cds and i uh, was gonna ask if that didn't happen to you like you weren't stuck with like uh, <laughs> oh uh, yeah one one of the one one of the most profitable things Waking Records ever did was uh I had a, a storage unit uh over near the Manhattan Bridge uh and all the overstock CDs I stored in there and it flooded uh and uh the insurance paid me out for all the CDs that got damaged <laughs> and so uh yeah it was you know uh there was a decent number I mean a lot of it is sold and like I kind of early in the rec in the label I started working with uh. Uh, ebullition mm -hmm. uh and um oh tom's on here now uh c86 i've been talking a lot about you tom um uh i started working well with ken at ebullition and and uh, lisa and they distorted all my stuff so they had a lot of stuff too and at some point ken was like hey like can i just toss all this and i was like yeah go for it because you know like with CDs, the difference between CDs and, and records is like back then you would press 300 records, maybe 500 CDs, you'd do a thousand. Cause that was just like what the places did. They're like, it's not worth it for us to print out 200 CDs. Yeah. 
So you do a thousand CDs. Um, Waking uh, Waking Records also had the the you know I don't know if it was a curse or whatever, but a decent number of our bands would break up within like a month of getting the CD. <laughs> this ship will sink and stop it. Um, yeah, uh, you know, so we'd get the CD, get it out to them on tour or whatever, and then they'd get back and be like, yeah, we're not playing anymore. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it ended up like that, but. So yeah, so a lot of it went to the great flood of whatever year that was, I don't know, 2006 uh, in my storage unit, but we got paid for it. So that was exciting. Um, and then, yeah, some of it I just uh, tossed, gave out to a lot of different distros and stuff. I was like, hey, like, take this stuff, like sell it if you can for a dollar. I don't need anything for it. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely did not clear out all the CDs. Every, every vinyl record release I did sold out fairly quickly, but the CDs, you know, there were a thousand of them yeah yeah uh i want like how did will get involved in this with clean plate did like did you reach out to will like this is going to be my memory again did will was will involved <laughs> uh, it, it has a clean plate uh logo right in the inside of it that does the red record does oh i thought i thought will had something to do I, with the i don't think I don't think Will did anything with that. I asked Wolves for uh, a song, but they couldn't give me a song because I think they were giving uh, my friend Ryan a song for his Alcala comp. Yeah. Um, Will Will definitely was involved in the Reds record. Will was one of the uh, the the uh, the cooperative of like five different labels that helped put out the Reds record. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I can always say proudly that we uh, we were on clean plate. Um, but yeah, so I put it out, um, Will put it out, Marianne, who did Eight Must Not Kill Eight, put it out, uh, Andy Malcolm put it out on, uh, Strictly No Capital Letters, who else, all right, I shouldn't have started naming names because I knew I was going to forget somebody, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, like five different labels helped put that out. Oh, no um, kidding. Pure Pain Sugar, uh, in France was the other one, I think. Nice, nice. Uh, my bad. I, I thought, I thought, uh, Clean Plate had something to do with it. Oh. And then, and then Will... You know, Will Will got involved. Like we were just friends with Will. Like you know, Colin knew Will uh, from back in the day, and and uh, and so we were friends with the Ampere guys. Stephen lived with me for a first cut his first couple weeks when he moved to New York. Um, Reds played with. Uh, did we play with Ampere? They, they just set up shows. I don't, I don't think they played the. We played at the, the Flywheel, um, and Megan set up that show. Um, yeah, and we were just friends with them. And so then Will Will did some of the mastering on, I think, some of the releases that I did. And he remastered or mixed the, uh, when we put out the tape with Ron, we sent him all the stuff to, because we found like some, some live recordings and some other random stuff. So Will uh, helped with that. Um, yeah, and, you know, just been a homie. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, lastly, with Waking Records, um, I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite re release you did? Uh, so I was about to say, I can't answer that, uh, you know, it'd be too, but I, I can, I can definitely answer that. Uh, the Butterbrains record, um, like I said, Sarah Kirsch, uh, being in Pinhead Gunpowder was one of the things that really moved me from the pop punk world into like the hardcore world. And, and I don't, I, I don't, I won't say move cause you know, I'm still firmly, firmly in love with that Lookout Records early pop punk, but I have to always, I feel self-conscious and have to make the distinction of like, you know, there's a lot of bad pop punk out there, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, Sarah, you know, I think is probably one of the most important, uh, musical and personal influences in my life in terms of, uh, you know, what she did, uh, with her musical output. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the shivering, which was Spencer's band before bullets in, um, and had reached out to Spencer for a comp track for the comp and he didn't have any shivering comp tracks available at the time, but his other band hit self-destruct, uh, had a song and, uh, and gave me a song for that. And then I became buddies with Spencer and then Spencer started playing with Sarah. And I remember I was in Baton Rouge, uh, on a, like a vacation and Spencer called me at some point. And he, we were chatting. He was like, Hey, um, please inform the captain has a second LP that, that they're looking to put out. Would you be interested in helping with that? And I was like, holy shit. Yes. Like yeah. that first please inform the captain LP was like, you know, one of my favorites ever. Yeah. Um, and then Will ended up doing that. Uh, and spent 
Lancaster was like, hey, like Will's going to do the second Please Inform the Captain LP. Would you stare and iron a new band called Botter Brains? Would you be interested in doing that? And I was like, fuck yeah, yeah. of course. And so getting to do that record with Sarah and, and Spencer and that group of people, um, just in terms and like Jose Palafox and just in terms of who they were and, and their influence on, you know, me coming up um, was huge. And then that record is just phenomenal. Like, yeah. uh, it's just such a good record. The samples that Jake did and all the sampling uh, woven through all, kind of throughout all of the last several Sarah Kirsch projects, Please Inform the Captain, Bodder Reigns, Mother Country Motherfuckers. Uh, and then if you haven't, if, if people haven't heard it, Chris Go Thunder, Jake, Jake's uh, solo project is also great. Uh, weird uh, sample heavy dance punk. I don't, you know, but Chris Go Thunder, find it on YouTube. Um, and so, yeah, so the Bodder Brains record was definitely, uh, I think, my favorite release. And then that came out, I think, around 2007, right around the time that I was finishing grad school and starting. Uh, I had taught for several years and I went back to grad school to get a master's in counseling. And then I was going back into working um, and kind of just. Uh, at that point, and I talk about this a lot with friends, like 2007 kind of like dropped out of the scene for, I don't know, like 10 years, 12 years, just because life caught up with me, um, started working a shit ton, founded a school, had a kid. And so 2007 to like 2017 or 18, I really wasn't doing much in terms of records or shows or bands. That's also when Brett Reds broke up. And yeah. um, and so, yeah. Uh, what was the question? No, no. I don't know. Oh, my favorite no, record. Yeah. You, so the Botter Brains, the Botter, the Botter Brains one is like really, um, it's important to me. It, it, for me, it was kind of like getting to put out a record with one of the people who was really influential into me getting into that scene felt, you know, yeah. felt, felt huge. I think, I think putting out a record for Sarah or putting it, like if I had had the chance to put out a record for Aaron Comet Bus, so those, those are the two people I would have been like, you know, so I got I got one of them and, and I'm psyched on that. Yeah, and and so Reds Reds, uh, you guys started Reds in 2003 or 2004? Is that when it started? Yeah, around then. Uh, Dima can probably chime in. Uh, I think it was 2003. We probably started practicing and stuff and playing, and then 2004, yeah, was when I think the LP came yeah. out. It's yeah. so when 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 I was doing. Uh, sorry, I didn't prep myself as much as when I prepped for uh, for Ron's thing because. <laughs> For Ron's thing, I hadn't thought about any of that in a long time. So I was like, who did we play with? When did we do any of this stuff? Um, and so I had to totally remember everything. But yeah, 2004, the record came out. Uh, I think we started playing together towards the end of 2003. No, that doesn't seem right at all. 2004, 2005, yeah. Because I went on my, my first tour with the fiction was, was like... Uh, I started teaching 2002, 2003. My first tour of the fiction would have been like December 2003. Mm -hmm. And so definitely started playing with Dima. Uh, Ron, what's up? Uh, what's up started Ron? playing with Dima after that first fiction tour, I think. Nice. So yeah, Reds kicked off, let's say 2004. So so you, you guys put out a demo though first, didn't you, before the, the LP came out? Yeah, we put out a three song demo. There was three songs that ended up on the LP. We went out uh, and recorded with, with Josh uh who was in here earlier i don't know if he's still here but got to record with josh which was awesome yeah. uh josh is the best dude just tons of fun to record with to hang out with uh love that guy i love that he's he's on instagram these days there's like you know good 15 years or something and no idea where he was and then he's popped up uh and uh yeah just a great dude so we went out and recorded three song demo with him um and that had uh, three of the songs, uh, Lee Greenwood is my co-pilot, Dividing Unions, and I think uh, Do It, Do It. There's Josh. Yeah, um, Josh. Josh. Dima, Dima can be the fact checker in the comments. Uh, like, you know, they should have fact checkers for all these presidential debates. Dima can just be like, no, you're wrong in the comments, streaming. Um, but yeah, so we recorded the demo with Josh, uh, and that was tons of fun. And then I had a lot of fun, uh, and, and Dima and I, like, doing just the, the hand-done packaging for the demo, you know. This was back in the day of CDRs and just being able to put something on a CDR and, you know, yeah. uh, and it was easy. You could bust out a hundred of those and then have fun doing the, the packaging. I was talking to somebody about how, uh, oh yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm looking at Dima's fact checking. Uh, you sure Dima? I don't know. Okay. Um, Dima knows. Uh, 
Yeah, and so, you know, we put it in a brown paper bag. That was kind of like the emo hardcore thing to do is like something's got to go in a brown paper bag. And then we stenciled a few of them. And then that was kind of a pain in the ass because we were living, you know, I was living in an apartment and trying to stencil things in the apartment was annoying. So then we, I went and got some rubber stamps and I still have the rubber stamps and uh, we're using those like, you know, whenever we do stuff still. Um, yeah, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, wrote some more songs and went out and recorded with Josh again and did the LP. Um, and that was great. That was a lot of fun uh scott uh scott oh uh, going back to the cdr thing yeah like i was talking to somebody about how like you know people are doing tapes again now because vinyl can be so prohibitive and everything um and 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 the tapes are fun but you can't you know there's not as much fun packaging you can do with the tapes like i really miss being able to do like hey i'm gonna do a cdr i was talking about this because like you know reds at this point we're getting close to having enough material for an lp mm. and it's like that's awesome and and I'm always the type of person that wants to put out some sort of hard, hard copy of something. I want the, the artifact of it. And I love artwork and I love all that. So I don't ever see us like just being like, oh, we're going to record stuff and just put it up on, on Bandcamp or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we're also, you know, uh, old dudes with, you know, multiple other bands. Uh, you know, Dima's been in, been doing Kiss by an Animal for a long time. And, uh, and Colin is obviously in Seisha. Zach is in other bands. And so like, our, and, and I, you know, I've got a kid and Colin has kids and our ability to like go out and do a tour and play a ton of shows to really get a record out there is not the best. Um, so like, you know, the question of like, does it make sense to either do ourselves or ask somebody to do like vinyl for us is hard. Um, whereas like, oh, if we could just bust out a CD, CDR, like we used to back in the day, like that would be an easy kind of thing to do. Yeah. So and we'll figure it all out. But yeah, we're, we're coming up on the part. Uh, Lost Tapes, that's the one. Good. I don't remember the names of our songs either. So, um, so, uh, so yeah. All that to say about CDR. Yes. And then yeah. Um, I mean, old guys love CDs. I still have a, a bunch of CDs left because uh, I got was... rid of all of my CDs, which I regret. People are buying CDs again now. Like you go to like record fairs and there's like people like hunting down CDs. Like, yeah. I could. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the collector thing, right? Things become collectible because most people throw them out at some point, and then it's like, oh everybody else threw this out the one guy that decided not to you know but when you're living in new york city and moving every couple of years carrying around five thousand cds is not the most practical thing <laughs> yeah, um true. i like i just moved again and like all these records i'm like all right i either need to sell my record collection or never move again yeah. um so but uh but yeah we recorded the lp with josh too that was great um randy our bassist uh was also in dear tonight at the times Scott, our drummer, uh, I don't know that he ever really wanted to be in the band. <laughs> and so he came out to record with us and just wanted to record. And it was also during a big snowstorm in New Jersey. So he, he was scared of getting stuck in New Jersey. Uh, so he wanted to get through his stuff as quickly as possible and get back to the city. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of fun with that recording session too. Yeah. You, you mentioned CDs and uh, um, speaking of Josh, Neil Perry lineage, it's like you can't find that CD anywhere. And, and it's not on obviously it's on a vinyl or anything like mm -hmm. that um so i was pestering him to uh, put put that up on like spotify or apple yeah. music or something like yeah. that and uh, yeah a lot of those things where there's like you know I was, I was trying to find a record earlier today uh this band it's not a band it was like kind of a, a folk duo chris and stephanie that chris jensen put out on mountain records like brooklyn country band um and they just had a little you know flat cd that chris put out uh and it's not it's it's nowhere on the internet except on the mountain records website which i was excited to see there's still a mountain records website um but yeah a lot of i feel like a lot of the stuff that was on, ever only on cd you know just flew under a lot of people's radars and so yeah i know i know on discogs lineage is like i think it's over a hundred dollars if you like <laughs> if you want to buy it from somebody which i I'm heard josh is, i heard josh is sitting on a sitting on a stockpile of those and every every three weeks he lets one get out into the world and <laughs> You know, that, that hundred dollars a month is uh, you know, keeping them keeping them lined in velvet. <laughs> um, speaking of reds, um you guys disbanded and then seventeen years later you played a an initial show. Uh what kind of got you guys back together? I know there's a new lineup, uh, but how did that evolve into playing now? Yeah, um so, you know, I, I had stayed in touch with Dima all those years, um, fell out of touch with Randy and Scott. Uh, Randy went on to become a neurosurgeon. 
uh, a, a famous neurosurgeon. He was on like a reality TV show and, uh, you know, Alison Stewart, who used to be like the VJ or news person on MTV. Yeah. She, she's got her, she does a radio show on NPR, WNYC here. Uh, and she recently had brain surgery and she's like, came back from having her brain surgery. And I was like, Oh, we're going to have our, we're going to have my surgeon, Randy D'Amico on the show this week. Wow. And Randy was her surgeon. Um, so Randy is, is a family man and brain surgeon now and a J crew model. <laughs> he, 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 he kind of puts us all to shame, uh, you know, uh, but so he, yeah, so I fell out of touch with him, uh, fell out of touch with Scott, um, and, but stay in touch with Dima. And I think Dima and I kind of joked here and there over the years, that like, oh, we should, you know, play some red songs or whatever. And that we both still listen to the record regularly and we're proud of the record. And then uh, our hero, Ron, um, uh, reached out. I don't know when this would have been, if Ron's still on, he can probably clarify dates. Uh, I think probably around like 2018-ish. No, maybe not that early. I don't know. Ron reached out at some point and was like, hey, I love your record. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love your record. Uh, I would love to put it out on a tape. Would that be cool with you guys? And I was like, yeah, like, you know, super flattered, like kind of like surprised that anybody still cared that much. Uh, but I was like, yeah. And so we talked to Dima um, and Dima was like, yeah, that's cool. Um, and, uh, you know, reached out to, I, I had no way of getting in touch with, with Scott, nor do I think Scott really would have cared either way. Yeah. Um, but reached out to Randy and Randy was like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, just let me get a copy or, um, and I don't know if you ever got that copy. I'll see. Uh, and, um, yeah, so Ron put out the tape and then in doing that, we we're like, Hey, like if we're going to put out the tape, let's see if we can find some extra stuff for it. So Dima, you know, it's like Reds was around in the early days of like possibly being able to archive things online somewhere. And so, you know, like you go through old emails where like, Hey, we sent some practice tapes to each other. Or we find the CDR stash somewhere from a live show. Um, and so we ended up finding, we had done when we were on, we did a little weekend tour with welcome the plague year and uh, take down your art. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, funny story about Scott. I'll say uh, we, uh, we played a show like a radio show with welcome the plague year and take down your art in Maryland. And, I thought about doing a split 10 inch or something with the live set with welcome to play gear. And we both listened to the CDRs we got right after the show. And both of us were like, Nope, that's not, no, that's not going anywhere. My voice was shot and I don't know what the play gear guys felt about theirs, but, uh, but, um, so that didn't happen. But then we found that again, when we were doing the tape with Ron in 2018, thanks Ron. And, uh, and, listen to the live set. And I was like, this actually isn't as bad as I remembered it being like, you know, I, I got some squawks here and there, but you know, it's hardcore. Um, and so you were like, yeah, let's put that on. Dima had his, uh, his experimental track that he found that we recorded with Josh that we put on there. Um, and then we, you know, like redid the artwork and found some pictures and Ron made a little special photo booklet with, uh, for a handful of them. Mm -hmm. um and th that was a lot of fun and, and uh you know but kind of figured it would stop there and then ron was doing gene scene fest last year and was like hey any chance oh and then i did like the the podcast with ron or not yeah yeah um and uh and then ron was like hey i'm doing gene scene fest would you guys be interested in playing and uh he asked at like a time where my life was kind of falling apart there'd been in a relationship for, I don't know, like 20, 22 years at the time and that was coming to an end. And I was like, yeah, I want something meaningful going on. Like this will, you know, this is awesome. So talked to Dima and Dima was up for it. Um, and reached out to Randy and Randy was like, I sold my bass to go to med school. Uh, haven't played in however many years, uh, you know, got to protect these brain surgeon hands. Uh, so all, that all made sense. And then, uh, and then, none of us were really in touch with Scott. So we just didn't ask Scott. And again, I don't know how much Scott enjoyed being in the band when he was in it. Uh, so I didn't think he would want to do it. Um, but Dima, you know, Dima's stayed heavily involved in the music scene in Brooklyn the entire time done corrupt autopilot and kissed by an animal. And he's in the black block. He's in tons of great bands and, and, and does a lot in that scene. And so Dima had a, a strapping young drummer, uh, Zach ready to come on board. Um, 
and yeah, and so we we started practicing together and and uh, and felt really good. And uh, Colin came on board. You know, obviously Colin had been in the fiction with Dima and uh, a couple other bands, Gunners, uh, and uh, and just love Colin. And so having him, you know, we asked we asked Colin if he would do it, um, and it seemed very unlikely to me because that was right around the same time that Stacia was reuniting. And I was like, all right. Stacia reunion versus like joining Reds. What are the priorities there? But uh, but Colin, you know, was psyched to do it and uh, came on board and, and has been great and uh, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, and so we did that and then it was like you know everything felt good, so we started recording or writing some new songs and uh, yeah, it's been a ton of fun. We don't you know like I said, uh, Deem is in a bunch of band two at least two other bands now, uh, Black Black and and Kissed by an Animal. Colin's doing Seisha and teaching and has two kids. Zach is a recording engineer and uh, and plays in Debbie Dopamine. And uh, I don't even know some other stuff now still probably too. And so everybody's super busy. So our goal isn't to like, you know, the Kirby Kiss guys are out there. You know, they're old guys like us and they're just busting their asses and playing shows all over the place uh, and, and love those guys. And, I, you know, every time they post about their upcoming shows, I'm like, holy shit, these guys like, making it happen yeah. um Definitely. but uh but yeah you know we're, we're i think we'll probably keep playing shows at the, the the rate of about four a year i think uh for as long as we can um as long as we're having fun uh but yeah so it's been fun you know maybe we'll maybe we'll up that rate here and there but yeah yeah that in boston peeps let's let's get reds playing up here because you know yeah i would, I would love i would love to come up there you know we were friends with uh justin who's up there um from Cine human history and uh, the Sinaloa guys love those guys, uh, you know. Um, and so, yeah, we'd love to love to get up that way. So, you know, let's make something happen. Yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. Um, the upcoming show, like you said, a bunch of young bands playing next week weekend with you. Um, Respirator is playing, which uh, I love. I love that band. Fra Frankie's uh, my homie. So uh... Frankie's the best man. So Frankie, Frankie, I think was like. 15 or 16 and coming to to the shows that i would book at north six and like i would have to you know vouch for him at the door like all right there were like three or four 16 year olds that would come to those shows uh and they would let him come in you know we'd have to x them up or whatever but i'd be like all right they're not gonna drink you know they didn't have any interest in that yeah. anyway um but uh you know he would come to the red shows and, and all the shows that i did in the basement in north six which is now music hall of williamsburg and um and then years later, like, I don't know, like 2015, my, my good friend from Louisiana, Tim, had moved up to New York and somehow become buds with Frankie. And uh, I don't know, we were at a show and he's like, hey, this is my friend Frankie. Frankie's a big Reds fan. And I was like, that's the first I've ever, like, heard. And, and Frankie was like, oh, man, like, you know, you know, Frankie, he's like the most enthusiastic dude about everything ever. You know, he'll like blew up my head a little bit. I was like, all right, we got a we got a fan. Um, <laughs> And yeah, Frankie's just like the sweetest, best dude. Uh, you know, and he's like, his t-shirt collection is, uh, is insane. Um, and you know, uh, just a great dude. And so, yeah, he's an respirator and, and, you know, we've been lucky to play several, a few shows with them and just love those guys. Um, yeah. And they're playing there. I think they're the second oldest band. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, and if Tom's still on here, Tom can hype up in the, in the comments, uh, who else is playing, but, uh, Ultra Deluxe and uh, Ted Williams and um, Grim Litter, like all, you know, all these bands that like, I'm psyched. I, you know, I I've definitely haven't done a great job staying up with the new and upcoming stuff. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable being the weird middle-aged guy in the back of a show full of like 20 year old kids, but uh, you know, I'm not going to go to the high school kids show necessarily. Um, but I'm excited. I'm psyched to play them and hear them, um, you know, and, and, it's been fun. I think one of the things that Stacia did really well when they started playing reunion shows is kind of prioritize getting like a young band, mm -hmm. a new band that fit, um, uh, that fit into all that world. Uh, and so it's been fun hearing them play and being like, holy shit, like, you know, for better or worse, it's like, man, this sounds just like some shit out of 2002. Um, yeah. And then some of them are, you know, like doing some new kind of like variations of things. Um, but yeah, so that fest is going to be a ton of fun and I'm psyched on that nice that that's awesome yeah. the funny thing is i i saw the the videos of you guys playing live after all those years and uh it sounded pretty seamless like it sounded just like back at like 
there was no weird, awkward, like, you know, your vocals were spot on, the music was spot on. Like, do, 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 were you guys, once you started playing live, were like, okay, this is like working right now? Because it didn't seem like there was a 17 year hiatus when, you know. Yeah, from that. I, I think I think there's a few reasons for that. I mean, one, like I said, Dima's played the entire time, um, you know, and he, he, you know, his, uh, his, his licks are still hot um, and, uh, and so he's been doing it. I think he had to relearn a lot of stuff. And I think his, his playing has evolved a lot over the years. So I think a lot of it, he's like, was like, what the fuck was I doing when I, when I did this and had to figure that out. Um, but I, I think overall we're, we're tighter now. Um, you know, Zach is a amazing drummer, like super dedicated to what he does. Like, you know, he'll post like practice videos every now and then, but him like figuring out something he like practices, you know, and, and plays a lot. I don't know that there was a lot of, I'm not trying to shit talk people, but like, I don't know there was a lot of like, extra practice outside of practice uh for the drum stuff before um but uh but yeah zach's a phenomenal drummer i think we're tighter i think um i don't i don't drink before shows anymore uh uh and i and i say that like i was like wasted all the time before I, I wasn't but like you know i would have a couple beers just to loosen up and i'm just more yeah. comfortable with things now um the vocals like uh i have a lot of fun playing live and i kind of like try to save it all for the live shows like yeah um I'm 45. I've been teaching and, and raising my voice at kids for uh, 20 years. And so my, my voice definitely gets tired faster. And, you know, I've got to start doing some vocal warm ups or something, figure that out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I can hit it for one show uh, pretty, pretty solidly. Um, and yeah, so it's a lot of fun. And I think, I think the other thing is like, none of us have any reason to do this right now if it's not fun. Um, and that's not to say that before we were like had delusions of like, you know, Oh, we're gonna go into this and this and this, but like, I don't know. I don't know that I was as good as uh, as as good back then at just having fun. Um, like I said, like I've struggled with uh, taking myself too seriously over the years for a long time, and so um, I have a lot of fun. And and I think I'm also just like I think all of us are just uh, super appreciative now of uh, yeah. And then I didn't mention Colin, and then Colin's just also like fucking killer basis. Like you know, Colin's been doing it forever too, and so uh, and and you know um colin and zach get along really well the rhythm section's crushing it um but yeah i think i'm just really appreciative to have the opportunity to, to be playing music and and playing with people i respect and love and uh at the age of 45 um i didn't think i'd be here you know i was like i said dropped out of the scene for 10 like dropped out of doing things for 10 years was still buying records and stuff but going to shows like I, I just appreciate the ability to go to shows so much more than I ever did I took you know when you're young you take shit for granted right like I took I took all the shows that I went to for granted all the bands that I got to see all the friends that I made um you know and when I stopped going to shows like fell out of touch with a lot of people um and so I'm just trying to to be way more appreciative of that now and uh and yeah just like love playing shows Dima and I talk about it Dima you know Dima's the musician I'm not the musician and so like Dima, I think, is, you know, very into, like, recording and, like, loves the recording process and um, and songwriting and everything. And, like, uh, and for me, it's just all about the live show. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I just really appreciate playing live. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, my old band, High School Sweethearts, it's like, I don't necessarily like any of the recordings we did. But live, we were more of a live band and, and you know, be doing vocals and stuff like that. I wasn't huge, like practicing over and over and over again with vocals. So I like, just like you said, kind of waited till we played live and then it all came out for, you know, me personally. Uh, so I can kind of, you know, relate to what you're saying. Yeah. And I think, I think the other thing is, you know, I'm older now, so like I can't jump around and, and, and move around quite as much. So, you know, standing still a little bit more, uh, you know, that I think helps with vocals. The last, <laughs> The last show we played, I had a broken elbow and two broken wrists, and so I was like, uh, I was like in in, in a sling and, and a arm brace, and so that was the first time I ever played a show where I used a mic stand. Yeah, um, and it was kind of fun. I was like, all right, that was that was that was a fun little uh, fun little challenge. So, nice. Uh, yeah, and then Demo, then Demo was like, I like it when you, because <laughs> I usually like will just go wander around and like get up in the crowd and like whatever, yeah. and and uh, Demo was like, I like it when you stay up with us. <laughs> And, and I was like, yeah, that was, I, I like that too. I think maybe I'll do more of that too. So nice. Um, I don't want to keep you for too long. And you know, with my chats at the end, I do a rapid fire. So uh, yeah, I was like, ready for 
I was like, I watched your last one. I was like, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta practice my rapid fire qu answers, and I, I don't have, I don't, <laughs> I didn't. So we'll see how this goes. All right, well, we'll see how it goes. My first one always. Uh, what is your all-time favorite hardcore screamo band from New England? From New England, uh, I think Sinaloa. Um, I'm trying. To I think other, I mean, I love Wolves, I, you know, Orchid's great, but like Sinaloa just has such a, one, like I just think their music stands alone as being so powerful and and, uh, and great. Um, but then those dudes are just the fucking, they're the best. They're, they're all sweethearts. Like they were the first band that I did a record for where I just like um, heard, heard the first LP and was like, I need to do a band, a record with this band. And I think I like, wrote the email on the on the label or whatever and uh and they were like yeah let's do it so um yeah i just, I just love those guys and then you uh, you know you and i talked about currencia the other day um they were they were fucking great they were crazy it was uh mike conrad's band and um i don't remember any of the other folks from the name i know the drummer was in that band backstabber zinc and was like an insane drummer and then they had a whole uh piano thing going on they were great and i was supposed to do a record for them and they broke up before the record came out it was recorded and we were just about to start it and then they broke up and i debated still doing the record um but mike was like man like we're not going to be able to sell that record like yeah. don't do it um and i i, I want to like i think i have a cdr of that somewhere like that's another band that if mike and, and folks are cool with it I would love yeah. to like if I put up a if I put up a band camp or whatever I would love to get out that out there because those songs were great. Hell yeah! That but yeah, I, you know, Sinaloa, I think hand, you know th those are my guys. Those records are all phenomenal, and uh, and I'm so so psyched that they're they're back at it again yeah, and doing too. great. Like it's, we, you know, we when we played our first show, I was like, I it's got to be with Sinaloa, mm -hmm. um, and I was so honored and, and appreciative that they came down to play that show with us. Uh, yeah, those guys are great. Nice, nice. Uh, my second question. What was your first real hardcore screamo show you went to? Not like a Battle of the Bands type of thing, like kind of like a real, you know, venue type of thing. Yeah, I my memory sucks, and 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 do with that Instagram thing happening. You know, like what was your first show? Like I've been trying to rack my memory for all different sorts of things, and it's hard for me to like to pinpoint what my first one would have been. My first like screamo or hardcore show. Um, I think like if I'm if I'm thinking like DIY hardcore kind of stuff like uh, uh, Hot Water Music would have probably been pretty early on because that would have been like you know '97. I was making the move more of the move over from you know still like pop punk to to hardcore. Before then, I saw bands like Avail. Um, you know, so Avail like if we're talking kind of in the like hardcore adjacent hardcore world, like Avail probably would have been early on like moving over from like fat record stuff, um, yeah. lookout record stuff, and then like avail, you know, uh, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, my, my next question, your all time favorite show you played live. Um, I would say probably our first show. Uh, we only, I think only had four songs at the time, but I, I booked a show and uh it would be one of our two first shows either, either that first one because we had four songs i booked a show and i was like this is the show that we have to play and it was life at these speeds stop it sinaloa and wilderness medicine um and all bands that i just like loved and and you know a lot of bands that i was friends with already um and i was like we got to play this show and just being able to have that as our first show with so many phenomenal bands uh I think felt really special and awesome and it like you know i felt like you know it it in some way legitimized my my dream of being in a band i was like all right i'm in a band and i just played with all these amazing bands um and then yeah our our, our first show back at uh econo lodge where we practice and it's like a show space diy show space uh it just felt so fucking good we had so many people there that we loved and were excited to see us and my kid was there um, you know, I got a lot of pictures of me singing with my arms around my kid and, and my kid just kind of beaming, um, and, and looking excited to be there instead of embarrassed. Uh, I love embarrassing them too, but, uh, you know, they were psyched. And so, and, and just 
being able to like play with with Colin and, and Zach and Dima uh, in a space that you know I think is a really cool space that Dima and Zach and a bunch of people put so much effort into maintaining and keeping alive. Um, you know, it feels like a, a pretty vibrant little secret DIY space, and so that was an awesome show. Um, I say a lot, and this is when when I was in doing the thing with Ron. Like, I, I really wish I had a better archive of all the shows we ever played. Like, every now and then something will come up, and I'm like, oh shit, yeah, we played that show. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but we. I, I also like, and this is when I talk about not drinking a lot before shows. Uh, one of the shows that I definitely drank before was in Richmond, because uh, that's just what you do in Richmond. Yeah. But like, <laughs> we have we have a, I have a bunch of friends in Richmond, um, and uh, we we toured down there and uh, with Deer Tonight uh, and played a show that was just tons of fun uh, in a basement in Richmond. So that was another great one. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Uh, my next question: Your all-time favorite hardcore show you went to that you didn't play. Can it be a fest? It can be a fest. All right. Fest. Yes, of course. Uh, Shea Fest 99. Um, just the craziest lineup, but so many bands that were super important to me. Uh, so is it the Shea Cafe in San Diego, which is like, is, and it's I'm pretty sure they're still doing yep. shows, like a crazy DIY space on the UCSD campus that's somehow funded partially, at least I think, by UCSD. Um, mm -hmm. Radical anarchist space, like, and it was this show, it was, you know, the Shea Fest 99 had Combat Wounded Veteran, Reversal of Man played, uh, Yafet Kodo, Still Life, Torches, not Torches Drum, uh, Bread and Circuits, and former members of Alphonsine, who, Bread and Circuits was already one of my favorite bands, another Sarah Kirsch band, um, and I was like, so psyched to be able to see them, but I hadn't really heard of, tor of former members of Alphonsine until that show. Yeah. Uh, and they're, you know, one of my favorite bands of all time still. Um, and, and they blew me away. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just an amazing lineup. That was the summer that I was living up in the Bay Area working at Lookout Records. And so took a, took a Greyhound. I was supposed to catch a ride with the Yafet Koto guys down. Um, and then they were like, oh, our van's full. They are like, we can get you in our friend's van. Mm -hmm. And because I had been hanging out a little bit with Casey that summer from Yafet Koto just at shows in Oakland. And he was like, we can get you in our friend's van if you want. And I was like, oh, I don't know who that would be. I'll just take the bus down. And it turns out that that would, would have been the Bread and Circuits van. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was like, ah, shit. But at the same time, I was like, I, can, I couldn't have sit in a, a van with like them. I would have just been awestruck for like seven hours yeah. going down. So, uh, but yeah, that show is just phenomenal. Um, and uh, yeah, such a line. Still Life is one of my favorite bands. Still Life was... I had a friend uh, who, you know, like one of those guys that is like kind of everybody's friend, but everybody's like, eh, that guy, you know, but he, uh, at the time I was, uh, somebody had made me a mixtape. I was like, oh, I want to get into emo music. Somebody had made me a mixtape and there was a lot of like promise ring and get up kids and all that kind of stuff. And my friend was like, you can't listen to that shit. You got to listen to some real emo shit. So he like put on the still life record for me. And I was like, ah, oh, this is fucking great. Yeah. And so. Uh, seeing Still Life there was awesome. Ben, I'm really glad I got to see. So, yeah, uh, so still, yeah, that, still Life is awesome. Yeah, and so I, I, uh, I uh, you know, forever had all these shirts that I bought at that show. To Reversal Man, Combat Wounded Veteran, Still Life. Didn't get a Bread and Circus or former member shirt. I don't know if they had them at that time, but uh, yeah, those were hanging around for a long time. But I think I might have given them to Frankie or sold them to Frankie. <laughs> of course. I think. Yeah, I probably gave them away. I never sold any t-shirts. So I, I would just be like, oh, these don't fit me anymore. Gave away a bunch of those shirts. Should have made them into back patches. Now, speaking of shirts, is uh, do Reds have shirts for the show coming Saturday? Yeah, we do. We got, uh, we got shirts. I need to put them up online somewhere for people to order. Uh, be right back. I'll show it off. Hold on one second. Had to move around. I'm doing a makeshift piss right now, if you can believe that. <laughs> All right, yeah, so we got shirts. Uh, you know, wanted to go with the white. I like, I, I love black shirts, and a lot of the shirts I wear are, are black, but, you know, went with white. Um, so we got these. Uh, I'll try to get them up on the on the Instagram, too. Um, we got shirts. We got tapes. We still have some of Ron. Ron, you didn't have a shirt? I didn't give you a shirt at the fest? I don't know if we – yeah, we did. All right. Uh, you know, so – 
got shirts, got some tapes. Um, you know, I don't think we'll ever do like a reprint of the first LP just because uh, I don't think it would be practical. Yeah. Um, we got the master, you know, the CDR master somewhere, but like, you know, none of the lacquers or stamps or anything are, are uh, around. Um, and so I don't know if it makes sense to repress that, but you can also, most people that want that can find, uh, find that for, you know, five bucks somewhere. Um, I try to, when, when I, when I, when I come across one, like when I was in New Orleans at Brian's shop recently, uh, last time I was down there over Christmas, I, I, there was a Reds LP in the, in the bin there. So I bought it and resold it. Um, not for more money, just, you know, to get it out in the world. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Oh, here's, I actually, I actually resold it, but haven't sent it yet. Uh, this is why I stopped doing a label because I'm terrible at mail order. Some guy bought this, uh, months ago and I need to go send it, but you know, made it, made a new record cover for it. Oh, sick. Yeah. Have a lot of fun doing the collage stuff. So, you know, so there's our, our red stamp. So I got to send this off at some point. Sorry, guy. <laughs> nice. I'll uh, keep going with the questions. Um, I'm a big movie guy. I watch movies all the time. And I always ask this, what was the last movie you watched? Uh, uh, the last movie I watched in the theater, I took Mare and my kid and we went and saw uh, Deadpool versus Wolverine. Uh, I'm a, I'm a suck. It. It was good. It was, you know, it's funny. It was silly. Uh, I'm a sucker for Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, I, have, I have a very low bar for quality for Marvel movies, especially. So, um, uh, yeah, watching that, I was like, you know, I enjoyed it. My kid enjoyed it. I had to reaffirm that, you know, there are a lot of things in the movie that you cannot repeat anywhere. But uh, yeah. that was good. And then, uh, I don't know, I watched something the other day. I can't remember what it was. But yeah, that was the last movie I saw in theaters. Nice. So you're you're a Marvel Marvel guy, not a DC guy. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Marvel guy. I was never I could never get super into the DC stuff. Um, yeah, and you know when when I was when I was super into comics like late '80s, early '90s, Marvel was really just like, you know, crushing it uh, and doing all sorts of stuff. And I don't I wasn't aware of DC doing too much interesting stuff at the time. Um, you know, and then there was also like Spawn and the Image stuff and other like things, but um but yeah marvel nice marvel was my shit nice nice um also i'm, I'm big into hip-hop boom bap style kind of like the 90s version of hip-hop uh and i always ask this if you've been listening to hip-hop lately what have you been listening to if anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh so uh my partner sam uh likes uh you know just uh silly silly songs and so they had never heard of or really listened to two live crew and so i was like let me let me let me expose you to some two live crew so uh we've been listening to a lot of two live crew mostly in the car uh turned up really loud with the windows down um and so lots of two live crew uh and then you know hip-hop is something that like i feel like i i know and really love kind of the the things that everybody knows and love you know uh Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul and uh, but like it's something that I've kind of kept myself from going down the rabbit hole of because I know I could definitely go down the rabbit hole and I'm like I'm already like problematic when it comes to buying records you know hardcore and punk records and and just rock and roll records like I don't need a whole nother genre to go down so there's so many things like that like I would love to get more soul records mm. um, I love soul uh, I would love to get more metal uh stuff i would love to get more hip-hop stuff um and so yeah but if, if if you've got a playlist i the the kind of recent hip-hop that i or rap that i've like really gotten into uh or have enjoyed a lot over the last few years is just run the jewels yeah uh, i really like that stuff uh pandemic running i was running a lot during the pandemic and was just listening to run the jewels on so many of my runs and that's it's great and kind of you know again the political, the political hip hop, uh, kind of conscious hip hop stuff is really my shit. I think uh, I say that after saying that I've been listening to a lot of Two Live Crew, so I don't know if that really if that really checks out. Uh, but uh, you know, I like to think of Two Live Crew as just a really uh, sex positive, uh, you know, a message of sex positivity. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah. So if you got a, if you got a playlist or you want to put a playlist together for me of stuff, uh, stuff I should check out, let me know. Yeah. My friend Sal. My friend Sal, who is in a day's refrain, is, is a big hip hop guy too. And uh, yeah, and John, you know, he's an old buddy of Josh's. And uh, and so I'm like, yeah, man, like 
he's given me a playlist and, and some recommendations. I just need to, I just need to go down that rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually do a uh, monthly hip hop mixtape on Spotify that, that I create just like the new releases of that month for, for that style of music though. It's not like the newer trap style. It's, it's more the nineties version of stuff with, with new artists. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it still has like the, you know, the classic, um, people that are still putting out music too nice. nowadays yeah uh, uh, I, w I would love to check that out oh funny story do you, uh, i'm sure you, you know you're a hip hop, hip -hop head so i'm saying you know bobby schmurda i do know bobby schmurda yes <laughs> he 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 was the guest of honor at my back to school event at school this week okay. really yeah apparently after his time in jail he's decided to contribute uh and give back positively to the community uh and <laughs> And so Bobby Schmurder was, uh, he gave out free book bags to kids at my school this week and, and, uh, and free food, free dinner to the families and stuff. So good for him. You know, he did, did seven years for conspiracy to murder and all sorts of fun stuff, but, uh, coming out, you know, we're, we're a restorative justice school. We believe in giving people a second chance. So, you know, we gave Bobby that second chance and, uh, you know, it was nice families were kids were excited to see him, uh, I was like, yeah, I don't know that I've listened to all that much Bobby Schmurder, but I definitely yeah. heard a little bit of it. Yeah. But that, you know, all, the, all the drill stuff. I mean, that's the thing for me with hip hop too, is like working in the Bronx, you know, I started teaching in the Bronx back in 2002. And, um, and you know, I, I get that like hip hop's not for me. Like, you know, I'm the white dude from the South. Like I'm not growing up in that world. It's not my, you know, um, but I just struggled a lot with listening to, you know, to hip hop and rap that like, um i felt like was like hyping up a lot of the stuff a lot of the hard stuff that my students were dealing with and that were having a negative impact on my kids so like things that felt like it was like glorifying gang violence or whatever like i had kids that were getting shot and so i was like i can't i just can't get down with that even if it's you know like you know it, it was hard for me to listen to so i kind of backed off a lot of that stuff and and it's been hard so like you know drill rap and all this stuff it's like oh this this is and like you know it's like when you see kids that and, and you know this is again i acknowledge that this is some some white guy shit where it's like oh you know it's, it's a bad influence or whatever but like it felt hard for me to see my kids interested in that stuff when i knew and and you know and it, but again it's also like the same stuff that's down the block from them so it's not like they're just seeing yeah. it in the music yeah. um but it feels you know some of that stuff feels hard to listen to for me yeah definitely even if even if i like love the beats and love it and you know, appreciate it musically like um, so yeah, so the socially conscious, like, uh, politically aware stuff I'm, I'm more into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's funny you said Two Live Crew, because, um, I was listening to Two Live Crew probably three or four days ago, and I was with my daughter, uh, who's 15, and <laughs> she was, she was, she always, like, you know how, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you know, but, like, 15-year-olds in, like, my life start dressing, like, not like I want them to and and uh so like a year ago I would be like you can't wear that I'm like you like you're not going out like a hoochie mama and then <laughs> that song Ain't somehow, but hoochie mama. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that it's song awesome. came on and and she's like hey you used to call me that and then now she listens to hoochie mama so yeah you know you know and then I'll ah! Sorry, my, my, my box set up his, uh, you know, his fatigue. Um, yeah, and then like, yeah, it's just good stuff. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, you know, appreciate it. My, my partner, Carol Ann, we were on a road trip recently and we were like taking turns, plugging in. And she's an old, she grew up in uh, Allentown, PA and li uh, lived at the Pirate Cove, which was a punk house that did a ton of shows out there. And uh, we met through like a dating app when I started dating again, but then it was very, we're like, we, you know, she like hung out with Steve Roach back in the day. So we, she's a punk. So we, we yeah. know a ton of the same people. Um, but we were on the road trip and, you know, we were, we were exchanging uh, times, Spotify DJing. And, uh, and, you know, we were putting on a lot of like boy sets fire and like, you know, reminiscing about old stuff. And so she put hers on and, uh, you know, the, the, the Spotify DJ X or whatever, that he's like, hey, this is your boy X. I'm going to play some songs you've been listening to. So I was like, oh, this is going to be, you know, like, let's see, let's see what X plays for it. And it was yeah. all like, uh, you know, it was all like 50 Cent and DMX and, and, and all that stuff. I was like, you're not a punk. 
<laughs> You're not a punk. Uh, but then they, then he played like a Fugazi song or something. I was like, all right. I was like, you're safe. Got some, but, got some cred there. But yeah, so she, she, she's, she's big into, you know, she's, she's like, says when she is driving in the car, the main thing she listens to is just like, you know, booty rap and, uh, and all sorts of, all sorts of stuff like that, just to keep herself awake. So nice, nice. So I've been listening to some DMX and some 50 cent nice. as well. Uh, I got two more questions for right. you. Um, Next question: Favorite song for you to play live? I'm I'm into our I'm into our new stuff, man. Like I love the old stuff, but uh, I'm just so excited to have new songs to play. Partially because like I'm I'm writing vocal parts that don't hurt me quite as much yeah. uh, with the new stuff. But um, I think our our I think my current favorite song. I don't know. The new stuff is just so fun. Uh, my current favorite song to play might be um, this song called Break to Build. I think that's what the song title currently is. Uh, it's like 50 seconds. We're, we're playing a lot. We, we've written several. We wrote a song this week uh, that's 45 seconds. So playing it, like writing a lot of these just short kind of fast songs. Like, yeah. um, so that's a really fun one. It's short. It's actually from a band that Dima and I started after the 2016 election. Um, and it was with Colin and Miles from Books Lie and my friend Aaron, who was in uh, Burial Year. Um, and we played, uh, we never played any shows or anything, but it was a song that we had worked up then. Um, and we brought it back for this version of Reds. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a so fun song. It's about, yeah, 50 seconds, I think. And it's about kind of rebuilding my life from, uh, you know, kind of the end of the relationship that I was in, my, my marriage and, um, you know, just starting over, which also felt appropriate for starting Reds back up again. Like, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the only uh, the only constant in this world is change and uh, accepting and embracing that. And, you know, when things die, new things are born. So yeah. I, I, I like the, the message and I like singing it. And, and it's it's over quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great attitude, though. Seriously. Um, my my last question is, if you've been listening to any newer bands, I know you said you, you weren't really like, you know, uh, digging for new bands, but what what have you been listening to for newer bands in the like screamo or hardcore vein that you've been like enjoying lately? Yeah, I um, I'll, I'll be honest, like I'm not listening to a ton of new screamo stuff. Uh, a lot of the new newer bands that I'm listening to are, are do you know the record label Toxic State? I do. They're yeah. they're from Brooklyn. It's like you know, uh, kind of like thrashy metal punk you know stuff uh, i like a lot of stuff on on that label um and i've been going to a lot of those shows you know and, and a lot of those bands are also older too but um uh you know grillo who is in the fiction uh with colin and dima is and he's he's been in tons of bands over the years but he's in uh, a couple great new bands lethal and stigmatism if you haven't heard that stigmatism record uh you should get it uh it's like just old school New York hardcore kind of stuff. And uh, that's a great record. Um, the stig yeah, stigmatism record on, on Toxic State is great. Um, bands that, uh, you know, Praise, they're not a new band. Um, they've, been, they've been around for a while, uh, but, you know, they're still putting out new stuff. And I just got into them recently. Um, uh, they're putting out stuff on Revelation Records. Um, another Rev band, Planet on a Chain. Uh, they're great. There's dudes from folks from all sorts of Bay Area bands, Look Back and Laugh, California Love, uh, you know, Dead and Gone, you know, old, old, another group of old folks uh, still doing awesome records. Dave is an amazing front man in that band. So love that. And uh, hello. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's something I'm trying to like, I, I still buy a bunch of records. Uh, Oh, uh, this band, The Dark, that is on Toxic State, um, California band, like kind of like Japanese thrashy metallic tinged hardcore. They're great. They just played in New York, but I was out of town. Super bummed to miss that. Um, yeah. yeah. Trying to think of other stuff. Uh, that's a, a lot of that stuff, though. Yeah. Did it, anybody wow you at the Gene Scene Fest that, that you played at? I mean, was with... Doom Beach? Um, those two dudes, like that, they were. I think that was the band that I was like, man, this was fucking great. Like just yeah. the two of them, it was loud. 
I was, I think I was like standing right in front of the singer just because I was like, this is so, you know, they were great. I really loved them uh, and would love to see them. I know they like, I think they've played down. You can't have ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> All right, whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, they were great. I love them. Um, you know, Gene Scene was another, like Ron, Ron does a great job, uh, you know, staying in touch with the, with what's coming up. And uh, I think they were great. Uh, Thank you. All right, I'll have ice cream for breakfast too. Um, <laughs> Kiandi Ameda is great. Like um, we've played with them. Uh, you know, like Kirk B. Kiss. They're 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 new and that they're current. Uh, but you know, they're old heads like us. Old. You know, I'm not gonna say it, but I think they're older than us. Uh, but their stuff's fucking great. Like, yeah, always excited for them to put out new records. Medicinal, like the medicinal Kirk B. Kiss yeah. split is like so good. Yeah. Like the medicinal stuff's great. Um, yeah, so I say, like, I'm not listening to a lot of new stuff, but yeah, I, you know. Um, but in terms of the younger scene, like, there's so much going on in Philly, too. Like, mm. all the all all the Philly bands, uh, you know, Pyre, like, yeah. Pyre, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> you know, they're all great. So, yeah, there's lots of good stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for Ron for uh, keeping me up to date on new stuff, and Tom, uh, who's doing the fest next week. Um, and Tom's fun, too, like, you know, Tom is an old screamo dude like me, but he also loves all the toxic state stuff. And yeah. he, he goes to shows all the time. So it's like, uh, yeah. So, you know, trying to find my connections who will keep me, keep me in the, in the know on what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely. I love all those bands too. Um, I, the last show I set up here in New Hampshire, I, I hadn't set up a show since it, it was like, 15, 16 years uh, prior to the show that I had just set up, I had Sinaloa and Bravo fucking Bravo and La Antium mm -hmm. and um, I forget who, like a, a couple other bands played and it had been like 16 years and I was like, oh, I, I you know, I just want to set up a show, you know what I mean? Just one yeah. more show, maybe, maybe two, I don't know. So um, I, it's funny, I had Doom Beach and Medicinal came up to New Hampshire and played uh, as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm and the homies in new forms and and uh it was it was a great great time you know i don't i don't know if i i'd do it again just because like doing a show is kind of nerve-wracking you know what i mean I, and so. like yeah i i love doing shows because i want to i want to i don't want to be like one of those people that's just in a band that's always asking other people for shows like i feel like if you're in a band um you know you need to be doing shows too uh and, and providing shows for other bands too and contributing but even just like you know when we've done the shows at, at econo lodge where it's like you know that's our practice space like you know we don't have to worry about covering the overhead or whatever yeah. i just like want people to show up so badly for the touring bands or for the out-of-town bands that it's just like i just get so anxious that like oh shit, somebody's gonna drive here from wherever and nobody's gonna show up and i'm gonna feel bad yeah. um and it's an interesting thing in the kind of the age of social media. Like, do you like what? What does hard copy flyering look like these days? Like everybody just posts on on, on Instagram. Yeah. It's one of the things I really appreciate about Tom doing the fest next week. He's like making you know he's he's at Diami shows, uh, handing out flyers out front and putting up That's flyers right. in record shops and stuff. Like, got that old school mentality. So, yeah. The you, you mentioned. Antietam was an, another one of my favorite shows was we played up in I think Gloucester Worcester Gloucester one of those one of those places um and uh and yeah I think the shows were like Daniel Stripe Tiger Sinaloa Antietam I think played um and uh our homies No Omega which was a, a really great band that was Chris Terry from Light the Fusion Runs band in Brooklyn we played a lot of shows with them they were great um that's another band that if I if I do a waking records i feel like i should do a waking records band camp and, and put out like the cdr like post the cdr's recordings of like bands like no omega and, and our homies that were in cuddle machines and um and ape shit who like you know had a lot of stuff that never really got out there um yeah. so yeah i mean i'm i'm uh, i'm pleading with you to to you know get inspired to do it because like i said a lot of the times i do these talks it, it's to kind of remind people of how much dope music was out there and people that hadn't heard it for a long time can go back and like you know we'll mention a handful of bands in this talk and then people will be like oh shit i forgot about that band and then yeah. they go searching for that band and then all of a sudden that comes in their playlist again you know what i mean and uh a, a lot of the reason why i do these talks is just for people to remember 
you know, great music and get into new great music too. Cause we, we've been talking about newer bands as well. So, I mean, that's kind of my purpose doing this type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think one of the things I'm really psyched on too, and this is just the way that I think it always goes, right. Is like you go through generations of bands. So it's fun to like be able to play shows now again with people that we played with years ago there, you know, they might be in the same band or they might be doing a new band, but like, you know, uh, just getting to, to continue to keep keep that alive and and then revisit things that you know were around back in the day true true so i'm gonna keep pestering you like i pestered josh about uh like doing a band camp or something just to, to have people hear what you you know i mean birthday boys you you don't really hear that too much no so like um you know yeah the birthday boy stuff was great like i love those dudes and then like you know uh one of them went on to be in uh you know uh does uh oh shit i just blanked out on the the metal band uh triple a shows uh liturgy so oh, liturgy yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah liturgy obviously got really big but like and and very different than birthday boys but then birthday boys also went on to do uh i can't remember what they evolved into but they put out a record on like drag city or something uh you know there was basically like the birthday boys but instrumental which made sense because when we did the birthday boys lp they were like they sent me the, the, the master and I was like, you can't hear the vocals on this. And they're like, yeah, that's the way we want it. <laughs> and, and so, you know, uh, the vocals were so far down in the mix, you could barely hear them, but that's, that's what they wanted. And then they have just evolved. They're like, let's just get rid of the vocals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, thank, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. Uh, you know, I love doing these things. I'm probably only going to do, I don't know. I always say this. I'm, I'm probably only going to do like a couple handfuls more of these. And, and then, you know, uh, I've said that before, though, and somehow I get sucked back into it all the time. But uh, it's an honor to talk to you. I know we've been talking about it for a, a long time and I'm just, you know, glad it happened today. And, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm honored. Man, I, I love listening to your talks and uh, sorry, I, I know I, I get long winded and ramble on a lot, but uh, yeah, I've loved getting to talk and, and you know, I know you put energy into it. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to, to maintain some things sometimes, but I'll, I'll always tune in for your stuff. You you, you talk to great people uh, and, I, and I love everybody you talk to. And so it's always fun to hear from the homies and, and new folks and reminisce and get re-inspired. I feel like every time I watch one of your one of your episodes, I get re-inspired to to reconnect with somebody or listen to something again that i haven't listened to in forever and so i really appreciate you thank you so much i appreciate that and uh i hope you have a great rest of your day and like you said i, I my daughter's downstairs doing something i gotta go check on her but uh um, yeah. thank you so much and have a great day <laughs> all right take care all right i'll bye. talk to you soon see you soon all right bye